All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this kickoff of Cashmere Hills book tour for Your Face Belongs to Us. And it is definitely as creepy as it sounds. Uh, my name is Jolyn Dellinger. For those of you I haven't met yet, I teach privacy law and policy here at the law school, and I teach technology and ethics for science and society. And I have the pleasure of introducing your show tonight, uh, Cashmere Hill in conversation with our own David Hoffman. So David Hoffman, as I'm sure many of you know from your class, uh, formerly headed up privacy and security for Intel and is now a professor at Sanford School of Public Policy, um, co-teaching the class with Shane Stansberry here on cyber readings, uh, cyber policy. Uh, I would give him an extra title. This isn't a title that actually exists, but if it did, Collaborator in Chief is the title that I would give to David Hoffman. And he has really driven the collaboration across this campus of faculty and students who are interested in cybersecurity and privacy issues. And it's in large part because of all of the work he does in that area that we have amazing events like this that benefit all of us. Um, so thank you for that. I appreciate it. Um, also, thanks to Spencer Reeves, who always does all kind of work behind the scenes to make these things happen. Also, I am so excited because I've been a fan, a fan for a long time of Cashmere Hill to introduce you to her tonight. A Duke grad, of course, we need to say that right up front. I'm always proud of our Duke grads. Uh, a technology and privacy reporter for the New York Times, but she has been doing this for years. Uh, she's been doing this work for Gizmodo, for Forbes, for Fusion, for Above the Law. And she's been working in addition to telling us about facial recognition tech, which you read about um, in the book that we have today, uh, other important tech-related issues, um, talk space and mental health apps, consumer scores and credit card data, innumerable things about Facebook. Um, people you may know, uh, the shadow profiles, uh, the tech that's designed to keep our eyes on the screen, um, location tracking as well. Um, and so all of these things can show uh, and be evidence of the fact uh, that she is such a supremely talented investigative reporter. But one thing I wanted to point out in addition to that is her creativity. She is so creative experimental and thoughtful about where we are in our digital age. I just wanted to mention a few in case you haven't seen these from the archives that you should definitely look up that are my favorites. Um, one is from Gizmodo, the living without the, the big five. Um, and go, she, she went to such great lengths to actually create an environment where she could live without Amazon for a week. Without Facebook for a week, this is way harder than you think it would be. Uh, you've got to read the articles to know. To live without Google, to live without Microsoft, to live without Apple, and then I think one week without all of them. Um, ingenious. And, and it just also raises issues that have to do that go to consent and choice um, and our ability to choose whether or not to participate in the system, which are so fundamental to privacy law. Um, also tracking her husband, uh, with permission, um, to, uh, to check out air tags and tiles, um, transforming her own home into a smart home to see where all that data was going. So again, it's not just reporting on a company, but coming up with these ingenious ways to give us insight into how our data is being used. So uh, one last point I want to make before they start talking is you will often hear people talking about privacy as something that's at odds with the media and the media can invade people's privacy. I just, that's true, that is often true, um, but it's also the fact that the press, in particular investigative reporting, is crucial to privacy. It's crucial to our understanding of privacy. Without investigative journalism, we wouldn't begin to know a fraction of what we know about what's happening with our data behind the scenes, what, how emerging technologies work. And increasingly, corporate access to data implicates government access to data because of the many public-private partnerships that are built around surveillance technologies and data collection, some of which you're gonna hear about tonight. Um, so journalists like Kashmir make it possible for us to access and understand information that allows us as consumers and as citizens, importantly, to engage 
to develop opinions, to participate in the political process that ultimately will determine what kind of legislation we have or don't have, as the case may be, to regulate tech companies. We can't have an opinion about what we don't know. So Your Face Belongs to Us is a phenomenal page turner of a contribution to public awareness. I strongly encourage you to read it if you haven't already. I couldn't be happier to welcome you here to do to talk about your book. And we are so looking forward to your conversation. You are not allowed to take Professor Dellinger away from campus. The students here are not going to allow that. I, um, we're incredibly lucky here on campus for a number of different things. I think one is to have a faculty member who I believe, and I feel confident that I can say this, offers the best information privacy law class and the best information privacy ethics class anywhere in the country. Um, I was a little bit nervous when you started saying that you had a title for me. I was wondering what that would actually be. Um, it's easy to collaborate when you have such incredible colleagues like Professor Dowinger and the leadership here on campus. Um, Kashmir, welcome back home, by the way. It's great to have you back at Duke. Thank you. The I floor. graduated in 03. Uh, no, which allowed me to get your uh, national championship in basketball. So I'm just saying she's back now again at the end of the year. Um, the book is amazing. We had the great fortune, thank you for helping us to get early copies of the book and to be able to give them to a bunch of students on campus. The reviews are great. The, the opinions of Professor Dellinger expresses what I'm hearing from everybody who has read the book. It's a true accomplishment. We here at Duke believe that journalism is one of the foundations of democracy. And I think your leadership that you have taken of showing how technology right now has a significant impact on democracy and the reporting that's necessary to shine a light on that and to be able to defend the institutions that we need I want to thank you for that. Um, we are all in your debt tremendously. Yeah, I mean, it's my pleasure. I think journalism is one of the best careers, and you know, your job is to ask questions and be curious. And I love telling a good story, so I feel very lucky to do the work that I do. Well, and I think I have a sense that you could tell the story of what I had for lunch, and it would be an amazing story. <laughs> and that is particularly true in the narrative that you have laid out in this book. And I, I, let's just start right at the beginning on the front cover. And I'm wondering, you refer to a secret of startup in the title of the book. And maybe you could talk just a little bit, because there's a, many people in the room have read the book, but not all. And it would be good maybe to play a bit of the background to come up. Who is this secret of startup and the lengths that you had to go to understand what was going on? Yeah, so this book started in the fall of 2019. I got a tip um, that seemed basically too crazy to be true. Um, I got an email from a public records researcher I knew named Freddie Martinez, and he had been um, sending out FOIA requests to police departments around the country wanting to understand what facial recognition technology they were using, you know, what companies they were working with, how much they were paying for the technology. And he ended up getting this very surprising 26-page uh, PDF from the Atlanta Police Department. And it mentioned this company that he'd never heard of before, called Clear UAI. And he starts reading this, this document, and the first thing he sees when he opens it is a legal memo marked Privileged and Confidential. And it was written by Paul Clement, who is a very famous lawyer, you know, now a law firm partner, but he was a solicitor general, a top lawyer, you know, thinking of George W. Bush. And in this memo, he's describing and he says that they have taken billions of photos from the public internet, from social media sites like Facebook, Venmo, LinkedIn, uh, without, you know, he didn't, he didn't 
make a point of this in the legal memo, but without the consent of the people who face the sentence, right? Uh, to build a facial yeah. recognition app that works with something like 98.6 percent accuracy. And he says that the lawyers in this firm have used it and it's a better result. And he's basically written this memo to help reassure police officers who might use this app that they wouldn't break the law by doing so, which is pretty unequal. Um, and so Freddie read this. He thought, wow, this is crazy. The way he put it to me is this is the way of selling my Facebook photos to the cops and asked if I'd be curious to look into it, which I, I was actually, uh, I don't remember now, I think six or seven months pregnant. I was in Switzerland when I got the email. It was midnight and I was about to go to sleep, but I just immediately called him and I said, yes, I definitely want to look into this. And then started trying to look into Clearview AI. And it was a very strange company and there were a couple of red flags right at the beginning of the investigation. Um, I went to their, when I got back to the US, um, I went to their website and it was just very little there, Clearview.ai, and it just said artificial intelligence for a better world. Didn't say anything about paper. And there was an address that would that placed it in New York City. So I went to Google Maps and I checked where exactly they were, and it was just a few blocks away from the New York Times building where I worked. So I said, I just I thought I'll I'll walk over there and go check it out. And so I walked a couple of blocks over and I get to Google Maps sent me, and this address doesn't even exist. There is no such thing. So that's strange. <laughs> And I look on LinkedIn, there's one employee uh, listed for Clearview AI. He has two connections, which is, a, you know, that's less than most people have on LinkedIn. And his name is John Good. And I thought, this doesn't seem like a real person, but I sent him a message. He never responded. Um, I tried to find people that were connected to Clearview AI. It seemed like they had taken some steps to hide kind of who worked for the company. Um, I reached out to Paul Clement, I emailed him, I called him, he did not respond. I found Clearview AI listed on an investment tracking website called PitchBook. And there wasn't much there, but they did have two investors listed. One was a company, um, a venture capital firm called Pure Nova Partner that I hadn't heard of before. And my colleague who covered venture capital at New York Times hadn't heard of before. And the other person I had heard of before, his name was Peter Thiel, very famous venture capitalist, very rich from uh, co-founding PayPal and that's a very early Facebook. So I reach out to him, his spokesperson. I say, hey, I'm looking into this company, Clearview AI. I don't think it says you're an investor. And he said, oh, I don't think I've heard of it before. I'll get back to you. Never hear of him. Never hear from him again. So I'm pretty frustrated in trying to get somebody at Clearview AI to talk to me. Um, and so I end up finding police officers who have used the tool. Um, and I, police officers don't always want to talk to you when you're a journalist, especially when you're asking about surveillance tools that they're using. They don't necessarily want bad guys to know what they're doing. But in this case, I did find a few officers who were willing to talk to me. And the first one was a detective in Gainesville, Florida. His name was Nick Ferrara. He investigated financial crime. And he was very excited to talk about their UII. He said it was incredible. It was like no facial recognition tool he'd ever used before. Um, said he had a pile of kind of dead end cases on his desk and he ran the photos through Clearview AI and got hit after hit after hit. He said he had been patrolling at one point um, and there had been a bunch of college students standing outside of a bar and he asked them if he could test this app on them and that he was able to, under the dim street lights, take photos of them and identify four out of five of them and found their Facebook or their Instagram profiles. And the students were amazed and they're like, can we use that app? And he said, no, it's only for Um, And so I said, oh, I'd love to see what this looks like. Can you show me in Canada and search? Can I send it? And he said, sure. And I showed him some photos and then he stopped talking to me. I had a similar experience with another, another officer, raised about the tool. I sent him my photo, and he said I didn't have any of them, which I thought was very strange, and he thought it was strange because I had a lot of photos online. He said maybe the servers were down, stop talking to me. So eventually I recruit basically a police officer um, in Texas who agreed to basically help me investigate Clearview. Um, 
And he went to the website, he requested access to the tool. They were giving out free trials to police officers for 30 days. So they immediately sent him the app. He did some tests with, um, with the app and it worked really well. He ran the my photo, no results. And then a couple of minutes later, he gets a call from, an, from a number he didn't recognize. He picks up and the person says, hello, this is Marco from Clearview AI Support. I have some questions for you. Why are you running this cashmere to the ladies photo on Clearview? And uh, they ended up deactivating his account. And he was creeped out. Uh, I found it very chilling. He was very surprised that Clearview AI could see who he was searching for. I was very surprised that they had an alert on my face and that they were tracking who I was talking to. And that was, I mean, almost from the very start of pay. This was obsessed with this company and how had they done this? Who were the people behind it? And what does this mean for all of us? So you end up though finding out who is behind it. And I think you know, every great story needs great characters. Boy, did you have good material to work with <laughs> in this particular situation. Um, could you talk a little bit about how you found out who the founders and the people behind Clearview were and describe them a little bit? Yeah, so um, <laughs> so I told you there was that other investment investor that I'd never heard of before, Kiranama Partners, and it turned out to be a venture capital firm that was right outside of the city. They were in Bronxville, New York. So I took the Metro North up to their office, and it took a while. I, I go into this in the book, but basically I had to hang around for an hour because they are never at their office. And I thought that they were going to come in. Their neighbors told me they never come there. Um, so as I'm walking down the stairs to leave, I kind of give it up. The the these two guys walk in, and they just had on expensive clothes, and they didn't look money. And I said, "Oh, are you with Karen Alba Partners?" They said, "Yeah, we are. Who are you?" And I'm like, "I'm Cashmere Hill. I'm the reporter who's been following you at Eden." And the firm's founder, um, who's one of the two men, James Galvo, his face just falls. And he's like, Clearview partner, uh, Clearview's lawyers told us that we're not allowed to talk to you. And I, um, I, kind of, I had a winter coat and I pulled it aside and like pushed out my pregnant belly as far as it would go. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm like, I just, I came all this way. I've been leaving here. I'm thirsty. <laughs> <laughs> and so David Salvo, who's kind of a decent guy, he said, okay, why don't you come in? We'll give you some water. And I, and I said, you know, we could just talk off forever. And we go in and we sit down and we start talking. And it was kind of like the conversation with that, that detective in Gainesville. David Selva just got really excited um, talking about the AI and how, and how excited he was to invest in it. And that right now they were just selling to law enforcement, but that they hope to sell this pool to everybody, to hotels, to shopping malls, to grocery stores, to you guys. He said, I want Clearview AI on every phone uh, in America. I want people to, the way we talk about Googling something, I want people to clear view faces. And I was like, oof, that sounds a little dystopian. And he said, you know, maybe it is, but I'm convinced that privacy is free for us, basically. And I told him, you know, I am going to write about this. I have, and I explained to him kind of the reporting I've done, the police officers I've talked to, and I said, it looks really bad that this company won't talk to me and that they're hiding from me. It makes it seem like they're um, nefarious or bad actors. And I said, you know, I think it would be helpful if you talked to me because somebody in the story would think something good about the company. And so he agreed to go on record, and he confirmed to me that, yes, he had a deal with the first investor in the, co in the company, I later learned. He gave them two hundred thousand dollars for their clear view AI when they first called Smart Matter, um, and uh, he told me he was the people behind the technology. And there was two names <laughs> I've never heard of before. He said it's this guy Richard Schwartz, who turned out to be a little older, not your usual kind of tech bro young founder. He had worked for Rudy Giuliani and was the mayor of New York. Um, and the other person. The genius, the, the technical mastermind, was this young guy. He said he was descended from Vietnamese royalty, and his name was Juan Contact. 
And I was like, how do you spell that? So <laughs> and he goes up on the whiteboard and writes it out. And it, um, it was an unusual spelling. And he was this really young guy who grew up in Australia. At 19 years old, he dropped out of college, moved to San Francisco. He was uh, chasing his tech dream in 2007. He was with Facebook quizzes. He started to get games for the iPhone when these came out. And then he ended up moving to New York and falling in with a very interesting cast of characters. And he told me, you know, he is kind of trying to keep his identity hidden because he has a little bit of gawker history. And uh, I told him how there's this one guy on John Good, named John Good on LinkedIn, and he said, Oh, yeah, that's the old guy there. <laughs> and so Peter Thiel was involved, and so Peter Thiel has a long history of connections within the Republican Party and conservative movement, and there were other connections to the founders with uh, the conservative movement. Is that right? Yeah, so much that journey of kind of one of these stories. When he went to San Francisco, he he let his hair grow long. He played the guitar and hung out with musicians, artists. This was part of a liberal crowd in San Francisco. But then, in, in the 2014-2015 era, he later described it to me as he was radicalized by the internet, and he was very involved in a conservative crowd. You know, he, you know, he was retweeting people from Breitbart. Uh, Followed Milo Yiannopoulos, you know, all of those characters. And he moved to New York around this time, and a friend of his described him, you know, New York is a very liberal place. And Juan would walk around in like a big white fur jacket with a MAGA hat on, go up at parties, and people thought it was ironic that he was really very into Trump and excited about Trump becoming president. Um, and he was friends, he became friends with this guy named Charles Johnson, or Chuck Johnson, which is a name I, um, and it took me a while to put this all together, but it's a name I knew from media, um, because he's kind of a famous conservative provocateur. Um, they were pretty extreme. He had a lot of their food skating on this site he used to run called Dot News, and Gawker covered it a lot. And so one time that with Charles Johnson, went to the Republican National Convention together when Trump was becoming the candidate. They were very excited. And they actually met Peter Thiel there. That's the first time I talked about met Peter Thiel, if I understand it. And Charles Johnson ended up talking to me a lot for his book for various reasons. Told me that that's where the idea of the third DAI kind of came together. That they're on at this conference, they're conservative. There are kind of these people they saw as enemy, like liberals that are kind of there and watching it. And they really show them kind of an app that you could use to just kind of point your phone at somebody and get more information about them and kind of understand whether you should have friend that person, whether they're a friend, whether they're a foe. Um, and so yeah, that was a root. It was very um, it was very much kind of came out of the conservative movement in that particular time. And the first time. The predecessor in Third AI, which is called Smart Checker, was deployed, was at the Deploy Ball, um, which is this event around the Trump inauguration um, organized by uh, people who are very excited with some good wine. And Smart Checker slash Third AI kind of had taken credit for making sure that Antifa people weren't able to buy tickets for the event, which is they had done um, on this week and had and I learned this because they had put together this, this PowerPoint presentation uh, when they were pitching this school they had built to the Hungarian government um, as a border security mechanism. And it was out there, PowerPoint presentation about uh, how they could use it to screen people uh, coming in uh, through the borders, people that were arriving in airplanes, that maybe we could put through facial recognition technology into drones and that they could patrol the border and keep out, you know, ne'er do wells, which in this presentation was defined as people affiliated with George Soros and the Open Society, um, Open Society Foundation. Uh, so yeah, it was it was definitely some very alarming inclinations that the government had in its very early days. And you and I have spent decades talking to folks that are developing different products and technology, often even small startups. Fair to say, this is not the typical group of founders that you end up 
talking to, and that it's a bit of an unusual origin story. There. Yes, it was an unusual startup. It was unusual founder. It was kind of part of what made it hard for them in the early days to raise money. Um, you know, they they were a startup. They uh, wanted to keep building this database, making things bigger and bigger to figure out how to market it. And so they were going around to different VC firms, and some some investor said, "They, you know, I would just put off having a guy." They said, you know, "Richard Schwartz is like a car salesman." Juan thought that was real awkward, and what they were doing was so radical and potentially unethical. Were they pushing the boundaries of what um, I'd be comfortable with um, legally? And you know, and it definitely left some investors were were uncomfortable with kind of the, the conservative background and the affiliations of, of some of the characters that were involved in the early days. Well, I also want to say there's got a bunch of people standing in the back. Fine for you guys to come stand there. We also have an overflow room uh, in 3037, which is right next door. Um, but if you're comfortable, you can stay right there. Um, we've now established the who. Uh, and I think people have a general sense what facial recognition technology is, but I think it's important probably for everyone to understand what does the technology really do and how does it work to understand who people are? What's the data that's being used to train the AI algorithm? Yeah, so for clear view AI, which is they have a database now with 30 billion databases, which is you know many more people than exist on the planet. So for any given individual, their you know, face might be in there many different times. And you know, um, though my face was blocked from having results that when the police officer was searching me, when I finally got to meet with Juan John Pat, and I now met with him many times since then, he ran a search on me and I did have results. And I asked him about that. He said, Oh, must have been a must have been a bug before. Um, but for me, there were <laughs> for me, there were you know, more than a hundred photos. And basically he just took a photo of me and you know, within seconds, the screen just starts filling up with my face over and over again um, from many different years of my life. Uh, I'm in profile, I'm looking down, uh, and you can click on the photo, it'll give you the full photo, it'll give you the website that it comes from. So it's a way of having all kinds of information. You know someone's name, um, their social media profile, Potentially where they live, um, what kind of interests and activities because of all these photos that are out there. For me personally, Clearview searches has been weird. It has been like me at a concert and it's someone else with a photo and I'm just in the crowd. Um, in one case, there was a photo uh, of it was something in the foreground and it's somebody walking by in the background. And I didn't, I didn't think I was in the photo at first and then recognized this pose that the person in profile in the background was wearing and it was a coat I bought in Tokyo at an American vintage store and very identifying and very unique and I realized wow that's me in DC and I think the photo was from 10 years earlier and was able to pull me up you know this profile photo of me. Um, there's a photo of me with a source somebody I was interviewing for a story and that made me realize the sensitivity of, of these kinds of pictures that you know what can reveal. Um, so yeah, it can, I mean, one thing I think about a lot now is coming out of the pandemic, there are so many people that start doing online sex work and start starting OnlyFans accounts. And I think for a long time, people have assumed that you could be anonymous if your name wasn't attached. But with a tool like this, you know, anywhere where your face is seen can be linked back to you. And you can take books and examples of even one person who came to you talking about how that is something that that person does regularly, trying to re-identify those folks, uh, which I think is a really powerful way for us to think. We'll, we'll talk a little bit more about risk in a bit, um, but I, I want to continue on this. So we're like, okay, so they're developing this technology, these rather unusual founders. Oftentimes, I mean, <clears throat> finding business market uh, penetration for new products is actually really difficult, particularly because you've got entrenched large players like the large platforms that are looking for opportunities for 
new technologies to integrate into their platforms. So it, this this startup was not the only startup or effort creating facial recognition technology. Why did the large platforms just not already own this market? Yeah, so so Google and Facebook, I learned working on this book, both developed clear UAI type capabilities internally. Um, Google, as early as 2011, said that this kind of facial recognition technology to address that stranger was the one technology that it had developed uh, to provide against its back. Felt that it was too dangerous. Uh, Facebook, I have this really kind of absurd scene in the book of. Um, this video I watched from 2017 of the like six Facebook engineers in a conference room at Menlo Park, and they rigged up a smartphone uh, to the on the brim of a baseball cap, except held in place by rubber bands, and it looked like such a uh, silly and stupid version of the future. But when the person wearing the cap like turned his face at somebody, the phone would see the face and call out the person's name. Um, and so Facebook had developed this early too. And um, Meta, now Meta's chief technology officer is not talking about that. He thinks that the company should put facial recognition capabilities into augmented reality glasses. And the companies were just worried that this was too taboo, uh, potentially illegal. They, they had more risk um, because of the information are scrutiny. And so what Clear UI has done is not a technological breakthrough. It was really an effort that they took because they were willing to do what other companies, bigger companies, had in this way to really Let's extend that a little bit and actually talk about the business model that developed over time for their technology. And I'm thinking specifically their focus of narrowing at least initially and now maybe as a result of some legal issues on law enforcement. And they've made the argument of saying, we're trying to help catch the credits and shouldn't you all just feel safer because of that? And I, I actually thought you described in your book really well the answer to that question of whether that's a valid argument. Yeah, I remember asking one of that this interview I had with him, you know, he developed something that's pretty dangerous if it was available to all of us, you know, um, are you worried about you know, what you've done, the implications of what you've done, and the fact that you've stopped this much? Uh, and I remember he said, ah, oh, that's a good question. I'll have to think about that. <laughs> <laughs> and what, you know, he is going to have to. <laughs> and what he kind of said during that interview, this is the best use case for this kind of thing. You know, we are only making it available to police and security officers. You know, this is being used to, and, and they were actually answering to kind of cyber security and police and was using this for really shoplifters. But um, he said, you know, this is a time bombing tool. He specifically said, we're using it to catch and stop pedophiles, and it's not being used by pedophiles. You know, this is about children. And so it was interesting to me when I started digging into their background that they had not, in fact, designed the tool for law enforcement. They had just made this tool, and they thought it was really cool, and they were really looking for a profitable use case. And originally, they were approaching private companies. Um, Madison Square Garden ended up later going to the first facial recognition of the bio. Uh, grocery stores, hotels, um, you know, it really was, they were just, they were just Basically, out there trying to figure out who would pay for this. And it was, um, and they actually offered to get to um, Facebook business people they were pitching, and they also ventured out to other companies trying to get into the stuff. And so, one of the great weird stories in the book is one of these guys, Don Katsimati, this um, uh, business owner in New York, uh, billionaire, had grown from mayor there, and owns the graffiti grocery store. Um, he had the app on his own, and he was telling me about how he had been at an Italian restaurant one night and his daughter walked in and she was with some date that he had recognized. So he had the waiter to like take a photo of the couple and then ran the, the guy's face through the dirty red eye and he found out who, who he was, just like that. And um, he did not ultimately put it in his grocery store. But um, 
the reason that Hong Kong Cat Making Tools ended up selling it to police is that they were pushing it to a real estate deal. Um, and the uh, director of security there was Ben Yap, and he used to work for the NYPD, the New York Police Department. And he said, wow, my colleagues would love this app. You should pitch it to them. And so he set up a meeting with the NYPD. NYPD did, as predicted, it was really like the app. There are tons of officers are doing street trials, running thousands of searches, using it in active investigation. Meanwhile, none of us know it's happening. You know, the people who are doing investigations don't know this is happening. And the NYPD starts selling other law enforcement. Wow, we've got this super cool. And it just starts spreading from the NYPD to, um, to uh, law enforcement agencies around the world. And now Clearview has contact partner from Land Security. They Two million dollars to Clearview. Uh, they have a contact with the FBI, uh, and uh, the Navy is funding them, and the Air Force is funding to develop augmented reality devices that would be capable of recognizing faces that soldiers could see, for example, and they could, you know, potentially um, identify. So this argument that they make then as they're revolving who they're selling to and they're getting the huge feedback from venture capitalists, including Ashley Kutcher, right? So they, they pitched that, that was, did he have it on his screen for a while? Yeah, so yeah, they, they pitched to Ashley Kutcher, um, the CEO of <laughs> very famously now in his current scandalous moment, but uh, runs a, a child safety uh, organization called Thorn, and he pitched it to him for Thorn, but he got it on his own phone, and he thought it was really creepy. And so um, one day he was on Hot Ones. I don't know if any of you know this YouTube series where you're, you get interviewed while you're eating and you're hot chicken wings. And uh, he starts talking about this guy, not by name. He's like, oh, I have this really creepy app on my phone and I can take a picture of anyone and find all the social media profiles and like, privacy is over. And Juan Juan Pat was horrified when he watched this Hot Ones because he's trying to keep Clear View as a secret. And so he sent he sent Ashley Kutcher an email and uh, he was like, hey, stop talking about us. Um, and the problem that the companies are running into is it pitching it, you know, pitching it down, it's giving it, giving it to all these venture capitalists. And they all celebrities, Joe Montana was one of the pendant people that used to be OAI. And they all love using it, but very few of them want to give the company money. So. Yeah, and so they're having difficulty raising money, but they do see this opportunity with law enforcement. This is a really important and cautionary tale about that with the Robert Williams story. And maybe I, I think many people wouldn't know about that, but the response about why or should we not just feel comfortable with law enforcement having this story. Maybe you could say, talk a little bit about what happened to Robert Williams. Yeah, and I'm just going to preface this by the facial recognition technology has gotten very powerful, but it um, it doesn't work all the time. Um, as one privacy professor put it to me, we are not unique snowflakes. There are people in the world that we look like, and that's compounded with a tool like Clearview AI, um, where you know you're writing a search not just on people who might live in that area, but people who live all over the world, um, and so, so Robert Williams is, is a, a suburban dad who lives outside of Detroit, and one day he gets a call at work, and it's a Detroit police detective telling him he needs to turn himself in. And he, it's two days for his birthday, so he thinks he's a friend pranking him, and um, so he, 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 just, he doesn't believe it, and he's like, I'm not turning myself in, I haven't done anything wrong. He drives home and he pulls into his driveway. Um, police car pulls in behind him, locks him in. Two officers get out and they arrest him in front of his wife and his two young daughters who are very much abroad. They're crying. Um, and he's just like, Why am I being arrested? What have I done? They said, No, we're going to say, You know what you did. You got a warrant. And he ends up getting taken to jail, held overnight. And Robert Williams was arrested for his crime and forced to fight. Someone else. It turned out that there was a shoplifting crime, there was surveillance footage, they had run facial recognition on it. It wasn't clear the way out of the case. Um, it was a different system, but it matched Robert Williams's driver's license photo to the surveillance footage. And so he's in this 
interview with the detectives, and they're showing this this photo of the shoplifter, and they're like, "Is that you?" And it's a large black man, and Robert Williams is a large black man. But other than that, to his eye, they didn't look anything like me. Pulls it up to his face and says, "That's not me. And you look the same." Uh, and yeah, I mean, it is like no, there was very little evidence um, beyond the face recognition app, and then they asked a not even a law eyewitness, but somebody who had watched the surveillance tape, um, whether uh, to pick, you know, uh, the photo of the perpetrator out of a, they call it a six pack, but a, a six photo lineup. And that woman agreed with the computer that Robert Williams looked like this person. Um, and so it was really alarming for, you know, he had to hire a lawyer. He had to fight the charges. And this has happened now a handful of times. And one of the cases that I know of involves the AI, a man named Randall Lee, lives in Atlanta. He's driving to his mom's house uh, the day after Thanksgiving. He gets pulled over. He gets arrested. He gets held at jail for a week because the shoplifting crime, which they, it was basically shoplifting, a little more complicated. Somebody was buying his money person back in China stores in and around New Orleans with a stolen credit card. Um, he needs to be extradited to Louisiana for this. Supposed crime he committed, and so he's held for a week, and, like, and he has again no idea why. And I think one of the, one of the big questions is the story I have. I talked to officers who play an incredible tool, especially in child crime investigations, which is to have a photo, and they don't necessarily know where in the world these people could be. But using three D I also means that when you have this you know, person stolen in New Orleans, you're doing a search for a match to that person looking through a database of millions of people who don't live anywhere near Louisiana. Randall Lee has never even been to Louisiana before. Um, and so and you can really see how this could go very wrong very quickly. You can see in the stories also this whole idea of once you have an algorithm that has elements of bias, just putting a human in the middle who also has bias doesn't get you out of the problem. And so, you know, the, the Ben, I mean, you have been one of the great leaders in shining a light on these issues of racial bias with algorithms in general, but then facial re uh, recognition technology specifically. Um, but you also say in your book that the technology is getting better in that regard. And so I want to, you know, I think one mistake I think people make is when they start thinking that that's the only harm. And therefore, once that harm gets solved, then the technology is fine. I'm, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether the, or the amount that you think that problem is getting solved by some of the technology. And then what are some of these other harms that would still be? Yeah, so facial recognition technology was initially developed mostly by white men, uh, white male engineers and scientists. And they would use photos of themselves and photos of the people in their lab to train the AI to work. And so they basically developed these things. They used technology that, in the early days, it didn't work very well. It, you know, this was a very uh, uh, lousy technology for a long time. Um, but when it did work, it worked just on them. And this is disturbing. I mean, um, one of the first, like one of the first mass deployments of facial recognition. He was at the Super Bowl in Tampa in 2001. They called it the Super Bowl uh, when the media found out about it. And they were looking for criminals in a crowd. And it, it's insane that they even did this because the technology was just so rudimentary. It really only basically worked on photos of people who work in the real world. Um, and, and there was this huge bias problem. It just it didn't work very well on, on some types of people. It worked best on white men and not very well on other people. But it was being deployed in the real world. And there was a big backlash at the Super Bowl. But then September 11th happened, and all of a sudden, everybody was very excited about this technology. Vendors told me, you know, that shopping was at the mall in the airport. Like, everybody wanted to install this technology, even though it didn't work. And so this was frustrating for civil liberty activists. ACLU was a big you know, um, character in this book. They were saying, one, this is privacy invasive. We shouldn't have, you know, our faces scanned all the time for no reason. And also, it's a problem that it doesn't work. Um, and 
So this was this was an issue for a really long time. And it's very important for people to sort of to draw attention to the fact that Google threatens this algorithm, they they denounce out algorithms, fraud, people make noise, Google is mean. Um, and the vendor finally kind of recognized this and realized that there was a risk of threat. And that's that's it, it's that with these types of AI, um, neural net technology or machine learning system, it's it's what you use to create a, a facial recognition algorithm, it's the same kind of technology you use to create something like chat GPT. You basically feed a computer a bunch of data and allow it to kind of analyze it on its own and find these patterns. And so the recognition vendors realize this realize they need to train their programs with more data to base it. And it was easy to get in some way, like all of these photos that we've all put on the internet, which they were very much invested into these kind of systems. But they also went kind of some legal rights. Um, Google at one point hired a contractor and specifically told, told them, you know, we want to search spaces. And that contractor went and targeted homeless people and students. Um, and that was very disturbing. Uh, one Chinese company um, uh, basically offered their technology to Zimbabwe just for so that they could block real world faces um, of people that had darker skin. But they did address this. And so when it comes to bias, the, the good algorithms are a much better network. They um, do not have the same kind of differential performance, at least in testing by a federal lab and it's called NIST that does it. It's hard for us to really know how this is performing in the real world when we're using it for surveillance case. And clearly, we are seeing racist outcomes in um, the Robert Williams case. Uh, the handful of, of false arrests that we know about have all been uh, uh, people who are black. Um, most of them have been men. The last case we ever heard about was a woman named Brooke Woodruff, eight months pregnant, arrested for carjacking, a uh, crime committed by someone the month before who was not pregnant. Um, so, but it's, you know, part of that is, is a um, racist criminal justice system. Uh, and when it comes to uh, bias in the actual technology and facial recognition technology, it really has a lot of things that do not exist. So, if you could then talk a bit about some of the other remarks, you mentioned the issues that sex workers potentially would, would have or would, will have with facial recognition technology. But I mean, what about other groups that are potentially at risk because of the technology? So, so yeah, so I've talked about um, kind of stigmatized sex work, and that will be a problem. Um, I mean, this will be a problem for for any group that that has less power, right? Like this is a mechanism for people. Um, and so in the early days of Purdue AI, there was all these rich people who were using it and using it in all kinds of different ways, you know, using it on conferences, working, using it on parties, using it on attractive women when they met at bars. Um, so this could be a way that you gain more power. Um, I think anybody who shopping, you know, they will become um, pariahs. You know, their their faces are going to end up on lists because it's a known shoplifter. And so, how long does that haunt you? You know, if you shoplift once, is that going to follow your face around for a year, for seven years, forever? Um, basically, anytime you've done something wrong, because of the way this technology, you write. Um, your online dossier with your kind of real world persona, you think mm -hmm. that it's hard to escape your online footprint if you've ever had a reputational issue. That will move into the real world and it will follow your face around. Yeah, and maybe not just folks who've done something wrong, but some of the folks that have done something that someone else doesn't like. I think about the Madison Square Garden example that you provided. Maybe you can describe that a little bit more where. Folks didn't do anything wrong. And I, I think uh, Professor Dellinger spent last year focused on the Dobbs case and potential issues when there's recognition of when women might be going to get reproductive health services. And so I, I thought the Madison Square Garden situation was a good example of where 
somebody's doing something that there's actually no issue from a societal perspective with doing, but then this technology allows people to take actions against it. Yeah, and you can gamble You bring it in for one reason and it's being like you get your money. So that's just regarding it. It's a huge event venue in New York City. You know, it's where U2 plays, it's where the Knicks play, it's where the Rangers play, it's where the famous stadium. It's on top of Penn Station. And so they talk a lot about you know, the risk of terrorism there and wanting to see these bands in bigger venues. And so in 2018, the National Historic Garden bought a big direction to the system. And we're supposed to be used for this purpose, you know, keeping out somebody who's going to violate it. Well, someone who's thrown a bottle on a high court, people who have gotten into the fight, terrorists. But in the last year, the owner of Madison Square Garden, James Dolan, um, kind of a, a wrathful uh, billionaire who's known for kicking people out because they hold up signs that they sell the team, uh, <laughs> he decided a great use of the technology would be to keep out lawyers. Who worked at law firms who had sued the company. And there were about 90 law firms, you know, ranging from personal injury firms to uh, law firms representing shareholders in, in corporate suits. And they went through and scraped the faces of thousands of lawyers who worked at those firms from the firm website and then put them on a band. Uh, and I at one point went. Uh, went with a lawyer to be like, I don't have secret clothing because he ain't wearing this thing. But I went with her because I wanted to see this. And so we, you know, <laughs> a very experimental uh, <laughs> <laughs> I forgot to put it out. And so we, you know, we walk, we walk up, we're at the very entrance, uh, the very, the, the entry point, we walk through the door, we put our bags on the security belt, we walk to the middle section. And the security guard walks up to us immediately and says, Oh, you know, can I see your ID? She gets out her ID and she's like, What is this all about? And clearly, we already know, but um, he says, Oh, uh, uh, I'll have a security manager come over and explain it to you. And the security manager comes over and he has a little note and it says, You're not welcome here. And, you know, your law firm has sued us. She said, I'm not working on that case. I have nothing to do with that. And he says, It doesn't matter. You're not welcome here. And so the law firm walks. And she left the job. Um, and that happened to quite a few lawyers. Um, uh, Madison Square Garden also owns Radio City Music Hall. So it happened to a mom who was at uh, going to a Rocket show with her, her daughter's Girl Scout troop. She got kicked out. Uh, Beacon Theater. Um, one of the lawyers I talked to who just happened to do with his twin brother. And when his twin brother tries to go to Knicks game, he gets pulled aside and he, but he shows them his ID. <laughs> uh, this is a wild day. I mean, I couldn't believe it when this happened as I was reading the book. And even I could, like, couldn't believe this was already happening. I thought we were five or ten years away from that kind of really shocking use of facial recognition technology. But think about the other things you could do. I mean, yeah, you can punish lawyers, you can punish pesky journalists, keep them out. Um, you know, you can keep out anyone who's ever read any negative review of your business, which is a really good way to keep people from writing bad reviews. Um, they'll probably write bad reviews about the fact that you do this, but um, they probably won't complain about their meal anymore if they like coming there. Um, so yeah, I think it's a people really of good people of sexual orientation instead of or there's no uh, objection to yeah, we're all uh, polarizing. Right. I do want to say though. Um, so Madison Square Garden owns a theater in Chicago, and they can't do this here. They can't do it in that theater. They can't keep them out with facial recognition. And that's because Chicago has a law about this. Passed in 2008, I'm going to tell the history of the law in this book, called the Biometric Information Privacy Act. And it says that you can't use someone's, um, a company can't use a person's biometric, their face print, their fingerprint, their voice print, without consent. And if you do violate that law, you have to pay five thousand dollars kind of per violation. It's been very expensive for companies over the years. They've had a six hundred and fifty million dollar settlement over this um, for using people's face transplants rolled out for the tagging. 
if you get the name of your friend. Um, and so you have to imagine people are garden, you cannot take them out to strange places um, of, of people that go to the Chicago theater. You can't keep, you can't keep a party about that way. Like you mentioned, I think that's where we should go next. Uh, let's talk about potential solutions to these harms. First, I would say one, one thing. Uh, law students in the audience will always welcome you back to Cameron University. You might not be able to see it anywhere else. Yeah, that's okay. You can always come back and watch you play. Um, but solutions, really, I mean, I think one thing in the book that you describe pretty powerfully is okay, that was a good solution that protected the Madison Square Garden situation for a while in Illinois. But then we had major litigation. That actually, the Clintons don't think that they ended up winning. Mm -hmm. About the book. tell a little bit about Floyd Abrams' uh, involvement and what ended up happening as a result of the case being brought in Illinois against Yeah, so after I did the story about Clergy AI in the Times, the economy faced a lot of backlash. Um, uh, there were investigations by privacy regulators in Europe, Australia, Canada, and then the US that got sued all over the um, a lot of class action lawsuits over invasion of privacy, and the most powerful one was in Illinois because they had a law that was um, And they decided to defend themselves by turning to the First Amendment. And they hired Gloria Abrams, who's the preeminent First Amendment lawyer, you know, defended the New York Times, who's right to publish the Pentagon Papers. And their argument was hey, these are public photos on the internet. We are just collecting publicly available information and making it easier to search. You know, we're just like Google, the same way that Google goes out and indexes the whole web, and then you can search someone's name and see anywhere that name appears. That's just what we're doing. Um, we're just making photos searchable by face. And that was the argument that they made. And they said that, you know, Having Jiva um, restrain their ability to, to do that as protected and kind of speech protected information seeking. And the whole law should be unconstitutional. It was right? a violation of their constitutional rights. <laughs> well, law students here, by the way, if you find that argument appealing at all, you have to do a remedial session with Professor Donker and I, who will explain in great detail to you why that is a very bad First Amendment argument. Argument that maybe you could describe in short a short version for them before they take the remedial class that Professor Dallas heard on. Yeah, I mean you guys are the, the lawyers involved, especially you can probably explain it better. But basically, um, you know, this hasn't worked for Clearview. It hasn't allowed them to get the lawsuits that they're currently dismissed. And in Illinois, the judge specifically, there's two kind of separate tracks of cases that they look at the ACLU sued them there in state court. And um, they've also had a class action um, litigation uh, consolidated against them in federal court. So the judge said, nah, no. Um, people, the, the state of Illinois still has the right to regulate the use of biometric information. And sure, clear you. Know, you could go and you know print out all these photos and have human beings go ahead and you know sort them by who looks like, and that's fine. You have the right to do that, but to have this done automated using this 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 biometric information that's potentially harmful for people, you don't have just a, a First Amendment right to do that. And so she uh, she rejected their attempt to dismiss the case. And in the ACLU suit, they did end up settling that lawsuit. It didn't go to trial. And Clearview agreed in that case uh, that they would not sell their database of 30 billion faces to companies or to individuals, but they would only sell to one. You want to put that to a party, right? You invited all those lawyers to yeah. come. So shortly after that, one of had a lawyer appreciation day. And, uh, <laughs> we should have more of them. Uh, <laughs> say no. He sent out they so the company now has lawyers working for them all over the world because they are facing lots of legal troubles. And so he sent out this invitation to everybody. And the invitation said, please don't bill me. Uh, it was at it was at Michael's, which was like a power player restaurant in Manhattan. And they had drinks there that were uh, 
he meant a lot of <laughs> men they were in the state of blue. And it was actually interesting because he always used it. I didn't even realize it was or not. But um it was interesting because they were using the first amendment as a shield. And one of the things that they sought in discovery from the ACLU was all of their communications with journalists at the New York Times and the BuzzFeed, um, which the ACLU really objected to. It felt was very chilly uh, for the First Amendment rights of, of journalists. And they, they they did object to that, and they ended up settling before that really got um, resolved, of course. But yeah, they wanted my email from the ACLU as part of the litigation. Yeah, yeah. that's relevant. And we, we see this all the time in privacy cases, I think, where there may actually be protections in place, but whether people are able to litigate and go through the extensive process and the long process of being able to enforce such rights, they may not be able to. And we see this oftentimes even with the U.S. Federal Trade Commission of whether they have the resources to adequately take on well-funded entities that are willing to engage in litigation. You talked a little bit in the book, and after this question, I do want to open up for audience questions. So get ready, and Ethan, you're going to walk around. Uh, Ethan, we'll bring the mic. And I, since I have the mic, I'll take the privilege of asking the first question. All right, but not yet. <laughs> I'm going to ask one first. Um, the Europe, right. right to be forgotten. Yeah. There are other protections, other than uh, um, the biometrics law in Illinois. We have some flavors of those in some of the state laws that are coming in the U.S., but not the full power of what they have under the general data protection regulation in Europe. Uh, can you talk a little bit about if you had more robust rights to be able to access and exercise some control over the data that people had about us, whether you think that would help those situations? Yeah, so basically, as it stands right now, your place is better protected in some places than others. So, how, how well protected your face is depends on whether you do it. So um, who in here is from one of these states? So I'm going to name them. Just put your hand up in the air if you live in one of these states or from one of those states or have an address in one of those states. California. Connecticut. You can keep your hands up. Colorado. Virginia. Or Illinois. So all the people with their hands in the air are better, you have better protected faces. So congratulations. <laughs> so what you guys can do, if you hate the idea of clear view AI, you live in states that have a privacy law that gives you the right to access and delete information um, that a company holds on you. So clear view AI has a privacy request page and you can go there. You will have to show them an ID showing that you, you know, have a connection to that state. And you can ask them for your report and so you can see what their UAI has on you. And then you can ask them to delete the thing. And the rest of you are out of luck. I'm sorry. Uh, but if there was some kind of access and deletion law that was national law or if your state passed it, and you two would have more control over whether you would have shared these databases or not, there is another, we didn't really talk about it, but there is another. Clear view AI like clone. Um, as I said, what they did was a small arbitrage, and they're not the only people who have done it. And so there is one company called Chemi, public space search engine. Um, basically, anyone can use it. You have to pay a subscription. I have it. I can run a check on anyone if you want. I have 25 searches, so I can't do you all. Um, but with a subscription, you can you know do what you do on Clear View, where you upload fake. You can see where the full image, you can see where it is on the internet. Um, and this database is not as big as the UAI, it is a very social media site, but, but it is out there. And Tim I, um, you guys could use, anybody can use this room. And they actually do have an opt out where if there are results for your face that you don't like, you can request that they be taken out of the database. And from the reporting I've done with people I've talked to, it does work. So if you're, if you're leaving this and you're feeling some sense of despair, um, I will tell you that anyone in this room could do that. But it is pretty wild that compliance is out there. Um, I do write in the book about a very creepy guy who was addicted to porn, who, who Tim I is now kind of part of his addiction, who likes to find the real identities of porn stars and provide a copy of his photos of his Facebook friends. 
Um, there is a TikTok account um, right now that loves unmasking people who appear in viral videos. And they will just, for fun, basically, try to find out who these people are and try to make them look like these people. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's, it's kind of why I wanted to write this book right now, because I feel like I'm on the verge of this thing being everywhere and kind of getting away from us before we can exercise more control over it, give us greater ability to get our own hands in these diseases, make more decisions about what acceptable uses are. Um, so yeah, we'll just keep going. Uh, I, I think the book is amazing on that part. I think it's a call to action for all students, policy <laughs> students, anybody who wants to engage. You've got the op uh, opportunity to advocate for greater rights for yourself and for others. And if we had greater rights, you could actually see turning facial recognition technology into privacy enhancing technology where you could search yourself using these tools and then find out where this stuff is out there and ask for it to be taken down. I um, think the reason that Tim I, Paul Tim I, I think Tim is the stand for personal information management. And it is the way this site is getting that you're only supposed to look for your own face, your own face. Um, but as I said, we have subscriptions to do 25 times a day. I don't know why I would search my own face 25 times a day. <laughs> Ethan, you're up. Is it on? Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to start off by saying thank you for coming here. This whole talk has been really informative and to the whole team here for setting this up, Professor Hoffman, Dellinger, and Spencer, and the rest of you who made this happen. This has been really great. The book has been a super informative read so far, and you mentioned it earlier briefly about um, Facebook's technology, or Meta's now with um suggesting tags and how a lot of big tech companies were kind of looking for ways to improve their biometric data and find a front facing way to do it. And in retrospect, that method was a really good one. And in hindsight, not one that I thought about and maybe other people in this room didn't realize as well was a way that they were doing it. So I was just curious if other big tech companies that you're aware of right now have found other clever ways to hide in plain sight and do something similar to that where they're collecting biometric data for the purpose of face scanning or something similar. And it's in a way that we can't really tell, but if we thought about it, it's kind of obvious. Well, it does make me think of, there's one relevant FTC case on this, and there was a kind of storage site that was called Everallum. 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 And it was like the place where you could store your photos and make it easy to share with your friends. And he did this kind of tagging. And it turned out that um, Ever Album had a, uh, a sister company called, I think it was Caravision, right? Okay. Um, I think it was Caravision. And it was a facial recognition algorithm company. And it turned out that they had been using all these people's photos to train their facial recognition algorithm. That was actually one of the best algorithms out there that they were selling to law enforcement and companies. And the FTC said that this was deceptive um, and that it was unfair to their users. And it was a very unusual case in that they forced them to delete the algorithm and the training data they used. Uh, I, I've never really seen anything quite like it before from the FTC. And so that was seen as, yeah, you confuse people, you didn't let them know. Um, one thing I did want to say about, you brought up Facebook. And Facebook has said, their, their current chief technology officer, Andrew Bosworth, has said that he's interested in putting facial recognition capabilities into the augmented reality box, which they've been working on for years. And I, you know, um, Facebook has, while I was working on the book, they decided to turn off photo tagging and they turned off facial recognition technology on Facebook. And they like made a big deal about the fact that they were deleting the billion face prints that they had um, created for everyone. But this one person who worked there told me they can create it overnight again. They have all the photos, they can turn this back on. What I think I'm saying might happen is that Facebook might put facial recognition capabilities into these boxes and make it an opt in or consent model where you can decide if you want your face to be recognizable. And if so, you do, because they already have that social graph. 
So you could say in the same way that we you know, set the publicity of our Facebook profiles, your Instagram profile, you could say, okay, I want my face to be recognized by everyone. I want my face to be recognized by friends or friends and friends of friends um, or no one at all. You might, in the same way that you set your privacy settings for your Facebook profile, you might have privacy settings for your face in the real world. And I, that is one possible future. And I think it would be a way they could possibly do it legally. It's complicated because the scanning faces to see what somebody's you know, consent is. You're still scanning a face, so you're using a biometric there. Um, but it could be a possible world. And then I just think about you know, what happens. What kind of stigma gets attached to being a person who says that you don't want your face to be recognized? Who else has a question? Ethan, can you go hand the mic to uh, here? Yes, you can. And then Brady. Right okay, uh, thank you again, Ms. Till, for coming and to everyone for. Uh, call me Cash. Or call me cash. <laughs> okay, that's where Cash you can say that. Uh, <laughs> so, we went over this, though. We did. We knew it over. This, so I, I started. I started right. Um, so I, I was working in the tech sector in um, at the time when I first read your article. It was like early 2020. And everyone came to the office and was like talking about how it was like the front of New York Times and front of MIT. So I was super excited um, for this opportunity to talk to you. I think that like as you noted in your book and also in conversations with the beloved podcast host Michael Barbaro. Um, regulation lags technology. And actually on the first day of class, our professors pulled up uh, an article by one of your colleagues, Ian Filbert, and it kind of said that there's like decades in between the like invention or patent and actual federal regulation. I think I kind of wanted to tie that into something else you said in your book where it's like, this is not just a technological breakthrough, but also a ethical breakthrough. So I'm just kind of curious to hear your subjective opinion of like, where are we going in the short term on regulation? And do you think the fact that it's like more of an ethical question will make it more expedited than some of these other tech technologies? So I would like to, rather than speculate like what might happen, point to history, because um, so often past is so lost. And so one great example of where we've been in this moment before is with recording devices. Um, there's a great book about this called The Listener by Brian Hoffman, who's a Georgetown law professor, really great book. And there was this moment in, in kind of the 1960s, basically, where um, uh, we started getting these really small recording devices and bugs. And it was kind of crazy. Like people were, were recording conversations all the time. I think the way we see it most now is through the Nixon tapes, the you know, secret recording of conversations that were happening. And people were freaking out about this. They thought privacy was over. You know, your phone's going to get wiretapped. People are always going to be recording you. There's nowhere you can go and have a private conversation. And, you know, Congress acted. They passed the Wiretapping Act. And this is the reason that all of the surveillance cameras that are all over the United States only watch us and don't get you. Um, the Supreme Court also uh, had rulings around that time. That privacy for us in terms of our conversation. And when police are allowed to get access to them, if they have a warrant, you know, to do something like what happened. And so I do think that we can constrain technology, but it does require, you know, passing laws and enforcing them. And it is a harder, it is a harder problem now because of the global nature of the internet. Um, I kind of mentioned it briefly, but European privacy regulations. And that's really clear here. And they said, what do you think? It violates the privacy laws. You can't just collect people's photos without their consent and face, face print. Um, and, you know, they um, they find Clearview. Clearview has a big fine. They told Clearview, you need to delete all your business from your database, uh, Canadians, Australians. Clearview hasn't done that. But they did get Clearview kicked out of the country and out of those countries. And they're not doing it anymore. Um, and then you get to one. And Clear Minds is a company that the person that owns it lives in the country of Georgia. It is its corporate headquarters are in the UAE and it has legal services from somewhere in the Caribbean. And so I don't know how do you how do you regulate Clear Minds? It really requires if you kind of digital technology having some kind of international kind of enforcement um, 
some kind of system flaw. So it can be definitely challenging, but we have maybe not successfully done this in the past. Just two cups, thank you. Mike, over. And then we'll come up here. So I'll just stay here since I'm about to pass the mic down. Um, so echoing sentiments, amazing work. Very, very glad to have you here. Um, to store billions of images takes terabytes of data. And I'm sure they had to go through some kind of hosting service, AWS, Google Cloud. So I was curious, uh, one, if you looked into these collaborators, and two, how much responsibility do you think that these third party companies have? So for policy options, is cracking down on hosting services, or you talked about open source, TensorFlow, machine learning programs, is that viable, more harmful than beneficial? I was kind of curious your thoughts on that, because there were more than just two programmers who eventually made this possible, and AWS was surely aware yeah. of terabytes of photos and millions of calls to uh, recollect stuff. Yeah. So thanks. So that, uh, I'll... Right. Um, yeah, once well, Pat claims that they're running their own server, <laughs> <laughs> and that they have all the data on their own yeah. servers. Um, I am also skeptical of that, and I, I kind of not able to run that down because um, it, it, it would be such it would be such a computing load. Um, but he said, yeah, we'll do something called CERN or CERF, or some kind of open source software. But no, at the point that they're at now, they have to have um, a more, more robust. And this has been an interesting thing with technology. It's just kind of let's regulate by going into the tech stack or going down the tech stack, depending on how you're looking at it. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it can be an effective method um, if you have the visibility into the tech that they're using. That's hard for journalists like me to figure out, but it would be possible for someone to be able to be possible um, if, if it came to that. But at this point in the US, um, there doesn't seem to be anyone investigating that unless the FCC is sitting on an investigation that we don't know about. Um, yeah, there's probably been that much that, that happened to it that hasn't been reported uh, in the court. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kashmir. I think the book is really eye opening, both from a technology lens and from an ethical lens. I have a question about open AI. So um, Sam Altman, I think, tweeted a couple of hours ago, we are so back. They're coming with voice and vision such on what would be built on top of chat GPT. Have you looked into what that could possibly be beyond, because um, chat GPT has set a very good precedence with you know being amazing with doing all this tech search, but then bringing voice and video to that definitely poses a whole huge challenge. Have you looked into that? And also what is your take on how accessible it's becoming for us to build things that can image search, you know, can do all these things that would ideally be considered hard to do because you need these servers, but now we are just calling a model from hugging face and running it and being able to know there's a million things in, you know, as simple as two lines of code. Yeah, so I did get a tip a few months ago from somebody who said, you know, AI is developing for us. And it's like, well, what is that? Is that a That is what happens. You know, OpenAI took all this data from the internet and we set it into computers. There's definitely human uh, training involved as well that you know, that this happened. But um, yeah, and OpenAI was pretty open about it. Um, it's just, it's OpenAI is it's kind of like a open AI in a way in that it took existing technologies that probably some people had been trying to keep out there and said, we're just doing it. You know, we have nothing to lose. But OpenAI has been very and so they said, yes, you know, it can recognize faces. We're not, sh you know, it's not what it's designed to do. It doesn't do it as well as other programs designed for that. But we are not comfortable being the company that puts that out there. And so it, they had been dealing with it by when you upload a photo, and this is just what they were beta testing the technology with um, blind users, low vision users. 
um, and when they would upload a photo, uh, it would basically blur the face. Um, so that's why like, the software didn't apply to the face. And this was actually really frustrating for their beta testers who were affiliated with an app called Be My Eyes. And I talked to one and he said, you know, I am blind. I can't see faces. I would have to rely on this technology like this to tell me, is this person compatible? Yeah, are they frowning? You know, who is this in the image? Is this my face? What's the time of it? Um, so this is one of those tensions where there could be a beneficial use, but um, OpenAI for now has decided to restrict it. Um, and they actually, with the release that they did, they have this long paper, um, which if you guys are interested in these issues, I encourage you to go read, and it kind of lays out what their safety concerns are and how they are, the restraints they are putting on the software. And one of them, a lot of these big data products are thinking a lot about how much motion analysis should we be doing? Um, should we be identifying people's gender? Uh, and maybe it's a fact can go wrong, is there a question about ethnicity? Uh, there are a lot of these questions right now about how much of a to do. Um, on, your, um, on your second question, um, yeah, it, it's more about how easy it has become for us to build these technologies. I mean, I think that's the big um, takeaway from this book in terms of the, the current world of AI. I think for so long, policymakers were not passing really laws around technology and kind of relying on companies to make good decisions. And in some cases, that works. You know, as much criticism as Facebook and Google get, uh, they are not worried about what people think. They have a and when they started using technology, they did hold it back. But now that the software is being open source, it's much more accessible, you're going to have more radical actors like the creator of AI for this world that can build these, I mean, incredible technologies and they can just bootstrap it and do it for pretty cheap. Uh, and I think that, you know, we're going to see that with other kinds of people do things, things that are kind of frightening and things that we don't want. I feel like voice search is coming. We upload a little, person, a little bit of somebody's voice and just get all the recordings that they ever had on the internet. Um, one thing that kept coming up with uh, activists is they said, a privacy advocate for the Liberty activists, is they said, if we say that what Clear UAI did is okay, what stops a company from going around and buying hair clippings from all of the hair salons? And basically creating a genetic database of anyone who's ever had their hair cut. Um, or going around and rating people's crafts in a public state and you just build this big genetic database and then you, you kind of analyze everybody in the country and you can sell to states or you can sell to corporations. Um, but if you don't have some kind of um, you know, legal restraints on this kind of activity, it will be really shocking on this technology by the most radical. in the back seat there, you have some mugs? No, you, you, oh, are you passing? Wasn't that your dog? Have we repaid you before by asking you one of the first question? So, have there been lawsuits against law enforcement for their use of fair view and other facial recognition technologies? Um, if so, how have they played out? And if not, do you anticipate lawsuits happening? And how do you anticipate that they will play out? So I don't think I could think of a lawsuit against a, a government agent for, for using it. Certainly, there have been lawsuits, um, not specifically around clear view AI, um, but challenging the use of facial recognition in some of these false threats. Um, uh, there's been pushback in a number of those cases. There's one in New Jersey, there's one in Michigan, and, but that is is kind of about um, to be talked about. Is really pushing to get the sort of department to come up with better rules for how they use this, um, so it doesn't happen to other people. I called him when I was doing the story about Portia Woodruff, um, the woman who was eight months pregnant, and she was like, 
arrested. And he was really fraught. You know, it's the third time that that's happened in Detroit that someone's been arrested for um, for the crime of looking like someone else. And he's like, we can stop and we really want this lawsuit to um, have that effect. Most of most of the lawsuits uh, around his lab have been against the company itself. And it does raise this interesting issue, and it's one of the criticisms from uh, privacy activists, is that we are seeing this kind of privatization of the surveillance state. We have companies like Clear View AI that just creates everyone's faces. Um, these companies that, that gather location data from all these phones and create these incredible kind of um, maps of people's movements that they're selling. Um, and these companies called persistent surveillance systems that will fly planes over cities and just take a bunch of overhead photos. And the idea of saying that might be unconstitutional if the government is doing it, if the government is collecting and making those data movement. But what is happening is private company makes the database and then um, law enforcement can just buy it, you know, and they're not having to get a warrant um, as is usually happening. So a lot of people are feeling frustrated that these kinds of government activities are kind of falling outside of the constitutional definition. And when it comes to a private company, you know, we don't have uh, we don't have the same kind of uh, public information um, laws that allow me to go to the state AI, for example, and say, uh, as a journalist or as a private citizen, like I want I want you to tell me about this. And so it really is. So that is a great segue to what I want to do is ask the last question okay. of you, uh, which is the exact same question the last time you were on campus as the last question, um, which is with a lot of students here who are really interested in these issues. They're interested in uh, all of these taking Professor Ellinger's class, um, interested in doing research and interested in going out into the world and making a practical impact. Do you have recommendations on the things? How they should be focusing their time here at Duke, and then recommendations or guidance on how to make the biggest impact out when they're out of Duke. I don't know if it's the same advice I gave last time, but I would really just encourage people to hone your sense of curiosity and follow your curiosity. And uh, really, I mean, where I got um, where I had success in journalism was when I found a niche that I really, really designed. And I was really interested in these questions of privacy. And this was in you know, 2009, 2010, and there wasn't any journalists that was covering privacy. So, um, so I think if you can find something that's unique to you, that you are really interested in, and just go deep on that, and become the expert on that, you will find great success in that. And if you are actually naturally curious in it, you're gonna enjoy your work. So much more. Um, and so I guess that's what I would say is just find what you really have a great interest in. And you may find that you become the expert on that thing. And you may make the rest of the world interested in something that they didn't kind of have on their mind at all. Well, and I think that's a wonderful thing for you to be able to tell them because you have role models that so well. The book role models that. The impact from the book is going to be incredible. And so I think we're so proud for you to be part of the Duke family and to have done what you've done and for us to, uh, to be able to feature you and show students the role model of what they can do once they leave. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs>